Hi, thank you everyone. We're excited for our first panel and I'd like to introduce the folks uh, who are up here with us in front. So uh, we have first Margo Hill. Margo is uh, a Spokane tribal member and grew up on the Spokane Indian Reservation. She serves as the Associate Director of Small, Urban, Rural and Tribal Center of Mobility. Hill served as a Spokane tribal attorney for 10 years and as a Coeur d'Alene tribal court judge. She earned her Juris Doctorate from Gonzaga University Law here, go Zags, and her Master of Urban and Regional Planning from Eastern Washington University. Her bachelor's degree is in political science from the University of Washington, and she is an urban planning professor right now at Eastern Washington University, where she teaches American Indian health and community, environmental planning, administrative law, planning law and legislation, community development, tribal planning classes, and federal Indian law. Join me in welcoming Margo Hill. We also have with us uh, Brooke Beeler, Eastern Regional Director of the Washington Department of Ecology. Uh, Brooke, whose name doesn't have an E, so she's just, but it's a, it's a very silent E. <laughs> Brooke is, uh, has served as Ecology's Eastern Regional Director since 2019 and has been with the agency since 2005. She began her career at Ecology working with communities encouraging environmental stewardship through education and outreach. Prior to her appointment as Regional Director, Beeler supported the agency with strategic communications and media relations on complex regulatory topics, and she studied biology at Whitworth University. Join me in welcoming Brooke. Our, our third panelist is Marlene Feist, Public Works Director at the City of Spokane. Marlene Feist, is the, uh, as the director, has been working for the City of Spokane for 25 years. Feist directs the city's major utility operations, including water, wastewater, solid waste, along with streets, engineering, fleet, and capital programs. It's a big job. Prior to take the position as a public works director, she was the director of strategic development for the division. She moved to public works in 2013 after serving as the city's communications director. She's a bachelor's in journalism and political science from the University of Montana, and she's a 2006 graduate of Leadership Spokane. Join me in welcoming Marlene Feist. And then finally, but not least, we have the wonderful Jerry White, Waterkeeper and Executive Director Emeritus, graduated from the Spokane River Keeper. Jerry White was born in Corvallis, Oregon, near the Willamette River. His family moved to Cheney, where he grew up exploring the lakes, rivers, and forests of the area. From a young age, he was raised by wolves, trout, and herons <laughs> along the Spokane River, where they taught him to fish and hunt. If you've met him, like this, you'd be like, no, that sounds right. You didn't write that? He traveled each spring to fish for native Chinook cool. salmon with his grandfather on the Willamette. There's a long history of working to protect rivers in the inland Northwest. As a former staff member of Save Our Wild Salmon, White advocated for the restoration and protection of native snake river salmon and steelhead. He's worked for Native Trout for Conservation Chair and continues to volunteer for the Spokane Falls Chapter of Trout Unlimited as an advisory board member. Join me in, in welcoming Jerry White. So we have a, a good amount of time and that'll be moderated uh, by the wonderful Vanessa Wildreff and I'll be keeping time mercilessly and uh, enjoy. <laughs> Thank you again. So uh, we gave a little bit of a preview of this panel uh, uh, in our morning sessions, uh, but I'll just give a broad overview and then save a little bit more of my voice. I'm so excited about talking all day, but uh, what we really want to hear from is from these extraordinary panelists. So when we posed this uh, to, to this great group of people, the vision was, well, what, what was 50 years ago? What are some wins that we have seen? Because uh, we can get very overwhelmed in the negatives. There are so many things that we still need to do to keep our water safe, to have our river be vibrant and healthy. And we sometimes feel overwhelmed with the negatives, but I really want to focus on some positives today. And so everybody's going to talk a little bit about what have been some great successes for our Spokane River. And then we will have the opportunity to talk about what are areas that we still need to do more on? And then we're gonna leave with a concrete, what can we all do to uh, have a, a positive impact on our river as citizens who live and love our communities. So I'm just gonna kick it off uh, and have our panelists uh, go into their presentations. 
each one of these people could talk for the entire amount of time and it would be wonderful and amazing to hear about all the work that they do and uh, their knowledge around the Spokane River. So we're gonna try to consolidate it into uh, four initial presentations. I'll have some follow-up questions and we'll wanna open it up for uh, questions from everybody here. So with that, I will turn it over to Margo. Heo putis in Kasihu, putis in Queli, putis lich laft, Swiss quest, so in Sipani, since Queli's quest, so Yappinson's quest, Margo Hill. Um, hello and good day, all my friends and relatives, visitors uh, to Spokane. I am a Spokane tribal citizen, and I'm very pleased to share with you just a little brief introduction. I grew up on the Spokane Indian Reservation out in Welpinit. Of course, these are all of our homelands. And uh, we were established here uh, along the Spokane River since time immemorial. And uh, we were relocated uh, in the 1857, 1858. There were wars uh, with the United States government and we were pushed out to the reservation 48 miles Northwest where I grew up. Um, I just wanna just briefly share a little bit of uh, our Spokane tribal history, our tribal perspective in relationship to the river and Expo 74. I was at Expo 74, only six years old, but I remember it uh, very clearly. Uh, these are some of my family members, my great grandfather, Basil Pion, uh, who owned uh, these lands that Gonzaga got out to the Pion Prairie. Uh, my mother, my children, I, I have four children, three biologically and a stepson, and uh, my family that gathered, there's baskets um, also on. I, I just wanna talk a little bit about my great grandmother. Um, uh, Brian did an amazing job at telling uh, some of the uh, history uh, in relation to the Missoula floods. Well, the Spokane people, we very much had oral history that told about um, how uh, the city of Spokane was created. So in CP, so in Sememis, so CP. Sadie Boyd, my uh, great grandmother, who who also uh, Chief Lot told the story of how there were there were floods and there were there was earthquake and the land was tore apart and trees and animals fell. There, there's a whole story. Um, but we say, the river gives us our way of life. And so um, when we talk about uh, the Spokane River, for us, it is very sacred. Uh, the Spokane people, um, we um, are each named, uh, each of the three bands are named in relationship to the river. Swinquamene, the pink cheeked people. Um, our name for uh, Spokane, the river, the falls, Skahet, place of fast moving water. Our whole life, our, our cultural way of being is around the river um, and the salmon. And so everything that was, ha everything that happened to the river happened to our people. When we talk about uh, the Spokane River and we talk about the ecology, uh, the tribes, it's every part of our being, our spiritual nature, our beliefs. Uh, the salmon chief, he would gather all of our people and we would, he would ask one young man to sing a song to call those salmon home. We no longer have that opportunity because of the dams and, it's th and our salmon are threatened because of the pollution. This is my great grandmother, Sadie Boyd. And there's oral testimony that talks about you know, they didn't include us in the discussions and the decisions to put up Little Falls Dam, Nine Mile Dam, Chief Joe. Uh, in fact, one of the chiefs found out when they were laying, putting stakes in when they were building Grand Coulee. But it forever changed our way of life. My great grandmother is recorded and she tells the story when they said, we're gonna put up these dams. And she said, well, what will we feed our children? And they said, well, don't worry. We'll give you government rations. You'll have plenty to eat. And she said, well, what will we feed our children? The Spokans, the Coeur d'Alene's, our, 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 all of our surrounding tribes, our diet was 60 to 70% salmon. 
And the Chinook salmon, if you go down to Riverfront Park where the carousel is and the splash pad, we would gather a thousand from three to 500 people to it swelled to a thousand during our June, June uh, salmon gathering. And we could gather in a salmon season, 150,000 salmon would come out of that river. And they aren't little pan fry. When I grew up, we didn't have salmon but my grandmother would still get uh, fish heads and salmon head soup that she loved. But the salmon were 80 pounds. They could hang from the, whole, the horn of a saddle to almost touch the ground. When those first government rations come up, came up to the reservation after they built Grand Coulee Dam, it was a wagon of salt pork and flour and lard. When we cut open the salt parks, um there were maggots and it was late into the winter. So we had to scrape it out and boil it because there was nothing else to feed our children. So my great grandmother said, what will we feed our children? The impact is beyond what you know. When we look at Expo 74, there was a lot of work done, but there were 50, 60, 70 years of degradation. Sawmills, our, our fish had uh, sawdust gill in their gills. Sewage, raw sewage going into the river for all of that time. The, the river, uh, the fish, we could see fish floating by in the river. So much damage was done. And the tribes are working hard uh, to protect uh, water quality. Uh, I would invite everybody to take a look at the Winter's Doctrine. Um, and the Winter's Doctrine says that Indian water rights predate any of the settler water rights the establishment of the reservation. For the Spokane tribe, our first agreement, 1877. Um, and so tribes live by this because we have a, a commitment with Mother Earth, with our animal people that they provided for us. And so we are trying to take care of them. So we remember the winter's doctrine. So many people forget it and re remember that tribes have a priority. During Expo 74, I was only six years old, but we, uh, somebody in, in their great wisdom placed us right next to the loggers. And so we had daily battles. I swear they would fire up their chainsaws uh, when our great grandmothers were praying or were telling the history. But my great grandmother stood up and she told about from when the first settlers came and from 1922, when we gathered out by uh, the interstate fairgrounds. The Spokane tribe, um, has applied for treatment as a state under the Clean Water Act. When I served as attorney, uh, uh, I was part of a team of lawyers, Dave Lundgren, Mary Verner, and myself. We worked with our, our Spokane tribal scientists and we applied for treatment as a state under the Clean Water Act. The US Congress expressly delegates regulatory authority to tribal governments by allowing us to be have treatment as a state and, um, and set our own water quality standards. So our application was approved and we set water quality standards. Tribes are doing everything possible uh, to improve water quality and water quantity. We are restoring habitat. We're working with um, uh, different uh, environmental organizations to uh, purchase land and put it in restoration to restore habitat so that one day we can have salmon back again. Um, this is a picture of a, a reintroduction of salmon uh, where our tribal scientists and our tribal communities worked with all of the environmental organizations, uh, the Inland uh, Lands Council, Inland Northwest Lands Council, uh, uh, the Forest Service, different folks. Um, but there is so much work that is still left to be done. Tribes are doing this work, reintroducing salmon um, and working to protect uh, the environment and habitat. Um, I, re I tell you, as this is Isaac Tanaska, one of my little cousins, this was um, the first time in 150 years that a young man was able to sing a song to call our salmon home. And so when we think about environmental justice and Expo 74, we remember the impact that it had on our city, that it, it um, affected the Spokane tribe. It moved Chinatown out of 
um, the area to establish this World's Fair, so many inequities, but we remember the positives also to clean up the water. And I, I just leave you with three things. We need to protect river flows. We need to protect water quality. And we need to work with our tribal partners and honor the tribal water rights because they're fighting to protect water quality and restore salmon to our rivers. Glen Lynch. Thank you so much, Margo, for that critical perspective of the challenges that happened to the Spokane River well before Expo. And I think that's a very important setting of uh, this uh, river panel. So I think next we have. I think I'm on next. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Well, good morning again. Um, Appreciate the time to be here today. I was very strategic. I have one slide for you all today, so I don't have to multitask. Um, excited to be here to talk about the progress that's been made over the last 50 years um, since Expo 74, but really there's still such a long ways to go. Um, uh, my slide for you is really about uh, the environmental laws. This is not comprehensive of what laws we have on the books, but to really show you that these laws are what we have to navigate and it has really shaped how we interact with the river and our community um, all along the way. So Department of Ecology was the first comprehensive environmental agency in the country. I like to remind people that we beat EPA by about three months. Uh, we have a, a long history of really strong environmental regulations in this state. So at the top are some of the big hitters uh, at the federal level in green and on the bottom are the state um, laws that we have to navigate to help uh, make environmental improvements, uh, including citizen-led initiatives that have become laws in the state of Washington, like the Shoreline Management Act and the Model Toxics Control Act. Those, The environment is so important to the people in Washington that they actually asked legislators to, uh, to protect their resources. Um, but ecology is not just the regulator. We're also a community partner. We pass through nearly two thirds of our budget in the form of grants and loans across the state to make um, to help communities navigate these laws. So um, Expo 74, we, <laughs> you know, it's well known that the World's Fair, we've talked about it a little bit this morning, uh, really changed downtown Spokane's dirty rail yards into the center of our community, the heart of where we gather. There was a significant amount of work that was done um, at the time, but it certainly wasn't up to today's standards. It wasn't really even up to the <laughs> environmental standards of the 70s. I, I, uh, we were just laughing in the hallway that every night they would blow off fireworks. And I don't know that that really met the obligations of the Clean Air Act necessarily, people breathing in all that smoke. Um, so thankfully throughout the years, more focused efforts have really helped the community uh, treat the river as the jewel that it is. Um, so some major examples where ecology has been part of the conversation along the way. Um, in the 19, early 1990s, the city was looking to reroute the Post Street Bridge. Uh, I think they were gonna move it to Lincoln Street, which was actually a violation of their own shoreline management program. And it would have significantly changed how we interact with the river down near Huntington Park. It would have just kind of put a big thoroughfare over uh, and we no longer would have that place to view and interact with our, our river. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, we knew that the river and the lake were suffering from low dissolved oxygen, and we were working through the Clean Water Act process to uh, develop new standards to improve that for fish. Uh, and we were really at odds in the community. The agency was you know, trying to be the heavy hitter and say, you've got to do this, you've got to make changes. Um, and some, some were looking to use the tools in the Clean Water Act to actually change the use of the river. This is a working river uh, and we wanna take away the ability to ha actually have fish. So after years and years of disagreement, we learned that collaboration was much more um, uh, beneficial or it was a much better tool to move forward and started working together on the dissolved oxygen issue and reaching towards the same goal. Uh, I think you're all familiar with Kendall Yards, another rail yard that needed to be cleaned up. And for many years, it was um, just a kind of a polluted gravel yard. Uh, under the Model Toxics Control Act, We uh, a developer came in, 
looked at how do I clean this up and turn this into a thriving mixed use development that is an, another place where our community gathers. Uh, in 2009, Avista was working on relicensing of their dams. This comes along every 50 years. So this is not an opportunity that uh, we took very lightly. And um, the state has an opportunity through the Clean Water Act to do a water quality certification in that process. And it's not just about water quality, it's about stream flow. It, it's also about aesthetics. So there were some really interesting pieces put in uh, to that settlement agreement where uh, Avista actually changed some of the, the dynamic in the north channel of the of the river down there so that they you could see water rippling even during low flow because that's a place, again, where people come and visit and gather and it's the heart of our community. Um, so I, I mentioned when we were talking about dissolved oxygen that really what's most important is that we are collaborating and that we have learned over the years to integrate how we approach navigating the, these laws that are in front of us. So we're not just going after one thing at a time, but we're looking at how do we get multi-benefits from the work that we're doing and the investments we're making. Um, and it's starting to become the norm. And I think Marlene's really gonna focus on uh, a lot of the work that the city has done to do that. So when you're tearing up a road, you're not just putting in a new water line, but you're also looking at how can I make this a better place for my community and fix my sewer line and put in stormwater and maybe make it a park at the same time. Uh, we haven't mentioned PCBs being the sort of the next hot topic that was really plaguing the river. We learned through our work in the dissolved oxygen um, TMDL to meet standards in the river for fish that, again, we needed to be collaborative. So rather than arguing with one another over how do we get to the solution of cleaning up PCBs in our community, we developed a, a uh, integrated task force that actually works together to identify the sources and reduce those pollutants. And that is even um, going further now to expand at more emerging contaminants that we need to address. Um, the city also looked at revitalizing Riverfront Park again recently. And instead of sweeping things under the rug, like we did in Expo 74, they used the Model Toxics Control Act to clean up the north side of the river, remove existing contaminants that didn't get taken care of in 1974. And again, we have refocused this community's um, center of attention on that beautiful park that is a place that we gather and a place that we uh, are together. Um, there are still occasions, so I have to say this, where we might test each other in court. <laughs> But that's balance, right? We're just making sure that uh, we're keeping each other honest all along the way. Uh, and then there's a few new regulations I wanted to point out uh, that have come into play in the state of Washington that again, because we're talking about environmental justice here today, the Climate Commitment Act and the Healthy Environment for All Act are really important uh, pieces of, of legislation and now law in the state where we can really think differently about how we give resources to communities that maybe are disproportionately impacted by pollution. Um, so the uh, the idea to cap and reduce greenhouse gases, it takes funding from, that program takes funding that actually directs to those communities that are being disproportionately or overburdened by pollution and our tribal partners as well. We want clean transportation, climate resiliency, and to address those health disparities. Um, so looking ahead, I think these will probably be in your conversations. How do we handle PFAS and other forever chemicals? How do you regulate something that doesn't have a number yet? Uh, and those things are, are things that we're going to have to navigate again in these laws that are up in front of you. And then how do we respond to, um, the, to climate change and what's cl our climate resiliency strategy? So uh, I'll, I'll stop there. I'm sure there'll be some more questions. And I think I turn it over to Jerry. No, Marlene's next. Okay, so I think Brian was talking about me when he said I only had seven minutes. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to talk about the integrated clean water plan. So kind of Brooke set me up here. So in 2013, we faced a regulatory requirement to manage our combined sewer. So that's where stormwater and wastewater come together by 2017. The problem is that our plan was too expensive and left some problems unaddressed. So our response was the development of the integrated clean water plan for the city. 
So our goals here were to get to a cleaner river faster, prioritize work that had a greater impact on pollutants, uh, implement cost-effective and innovative technologies. We looked at green technologies. We wanted to right-size the existing projects so they could actually be built in our environment. And we wanted holistic integration with other infrastructure. So we want to solve multiple problems because if we're going in and we're creating underground infrastructure, what else can we do? Uh, better streets, new water mains, parks. So our, our plan included three components. So managing those flows coming from the combined sewers. Um, we also included what we call the Cochrane Basin from a stormwater perspective. In the 80s, we got a bunch of federal money and separated the sewers on the north side where the soils are sandy versus the south side where we have a bunch of basalt rock and become very difficult to separate. But we created the largest stormwater basin in the city when we did that. Uh, all comes out at about a 60 inch pipe at the TJ Minoc uh, Bridge, if you are aware of that. Um, so we also included that project. And we also added improvements at our plant. So adding a third level tertiary treatment with membrane technology at our plant and to operate it year round, which was um, would be a, a voluntary thing. The stormwater piece was a voluntary component we added in the year round operation. It's about $340, $350 million worth of construction. We sold um, bonds in 2014 at a great rate, 3.08. Wouldn't we like that rate today? Yeah. <laughs> um, and we, they, we were certified as green bonds, uh, one of the first in the market to do that, to show that all of our projects were um, uh, improving um, our environment to some degree. Um, so when we look back on this, environmental justice um, has evolved a lot since 2013, but here's a, here's a way that we looked at it as well. A healthier Spokane River for all river users. Uh, um, this is really a free recreation area for swimming, kayaking, stand-up paddle boards, fishing. Uh, um, and so, the, so there's, there's no barrier to entry here for our citizens. So you can see the difference um, between uh, um, the integrated plan in the purple and the orange, which was without the integrated plan. So you can see this is on a suite of pollutants. You also include total um, you know, it's phosphorus, a fecal coliform, TSS is total suspended solids. So most of what we know is things like PCBs wide on the solids. So that's a good measurement to show how we're making a difference. And then of course, to Margo's point, downstream from us are tribal lands. And so the more we can do upstream, perhaps uh, you know, to try to attempt to reach those really aspirational and stringent um, water quality standards downstream um, is helping to make a difference. Um, we also know that affordability in our community is really important. 41% of our households are what we call Alice households, asset limited, income constrained, and employed. So basically, they earn more than the federal poverty level, but not enough to afford the basics. And they're employed, they work. So we have 41% of those kinds of households in Spokane, compared to 24% in the state and 29% nationwide. So we had to go with affordability here. There's no way. And we can see this slide is very difficult, or this chart is really difficult for you to read. But basically what we're showing you here is that more of our BIPOC communities have a higher percentage of Alice families. So um, it, it, it hits both ways, right? So we're also helping those who are low income, but also those um, communities that have been um, underserved. So our, our clean water plan actually reduced our costs from 490 million down to that 340. Uh, um, we limited uh, utility rate increases to um, a 25 year inflation number of 2.9% over the last decade, even with these improvements um, coming into play. And we um, implemented a wastewater credit for low water users. So if you were amongst the lowest 20% of our water users, for indoor use, so we measured your wintertime use, you also got a credit, which helps um, smaller families, a lot of you know, seniors on fixed incomes get that credit. Um, we, let's also look at the geographic considerations because we live in a bowl, um, the water flows downhill toward our treatment plant. So most of the tanks, the CSO tanks were located, uh, are located next to the Spokane River at the, in the lower, um, in the older neighborhoods, less affluent neighborhoods, and so we wanted to focus on providing above ground benefits when we were building below ground infrastructure, particularly considering the, the neighborhoods that we were in, investing in. So here's a couple of examples just for, uh, for you to see. So you can see at First and Adams, which is really in West Downtown, it's the largest tank in our system at 2.4 million gallons it holds and then meters that, that water to the treatment plant for full treatment. It is now a plaza. Um, and uh, highly used. Uh, if, if anybody you've had a beer, you've had a beer on top of a sewage tank. 
Um, here is the Spokane Falls Plaza. Um, this one is right next to City Hall and across the street from the downtown library. Uh, um, the artwork here actually was organized by um, Jeff Ferguson of the Spokane Tribe. Where's Jeff? There he is. Um, so he did a great job with Smoker Marchant doing a lot of the, the figures um, that you see on there. Um, also these incredible salmon pieces. This plaza, unfortunately, has been a little abused lately because of um, some you know, you know things happening in the downtown core, but it is our goal to tell the story of the CSO system, but also to tell the story of the tribal connection to the river here. Um, here's some other examples above ground benefits. Um, so on Sprague Avenue, uh, we have a charter school and across the street is a playground. Those kids did not have green space to play soccer or whatever they do during their PE classes. And so they mow the lawn and use it for class. Um, the other one is, is Doomsday Hill as part of Bloomsday. If any of you are in training, I know probably Vanessa is in training to go do that. Um, this is the, the big hill. Um, but when you're, when you're taking that run up Doomsday, know that you're actually running up uh, over a tank that helps to improve river quality. Um, so uh, here's another look at it from a climate change perspective. We know more precipitation will fall as rain than snow. We're going to have more intense storms. Timing of storms will change. More rain on frozen ground, which is probably our worst scenario for runoff to the river. Um, and we are working to mitigate that active, active control with uh, those flows within our CSO system. You can see our CSO system has really been successful with the chart. Um, so you can see the volumes of overflow to the river in blue. You can see the CSO tank usage. So anything that goes to the tank goes to the treatment plant. And you can see the frequency. In 2013, um, we actually uh, overflowed a hundred, around 100,000 gallons of CSO. Um, and, and if you compare that to um, about 8 million, I think is what the 2014 number is. So um, incredible achievement, but we know that we're gonna have to keep working on it um, with uh, the, those SCADA controls. Um, here's other ways that we're doing it. We're, we're taking water out up, upstream, scalping it off. This one is right outside our door on Sharp Avenue. So this is actually, um, so Sharp has become a stormwater pilot. It's one of the highest pedestrian counts in the city, as you would imagine, as students walk across to go to school. And uh, we inverted the crown of the road, put the swales in the middle, created bump outs. So we improved pedestrian safety while also managing um, stormwater. Here's another example in West Central, another less affluent area in our town where we were missing sidewalks and missing street trees. So we put underground swells using these technology called silva cells and created underground swales and created new tree wells and improved sidewalks. So where are we today? Um, we've completed a system to manage those overflows. We've installed, these are the membranes from um, the wastewater treatment plant. We've installed that, those at, the, at our treatment facility. Um, we're finishing work to manage the, the flows from the Cochrane Stormwater Basin. This will end up with lots of great um, features in the disc golf course, if any of you have done that. Um, and we're working on continuous monitoring and modeling. Um, we also uh, were one of the named litigants suing Monsanto for PCBs, and we have gotten $20 million to date out of that settlement, $500 million for communities across the, set, uh, across the country. Our case was farthest along in the litigation process when we led to settlement. So yay, Spokane. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we supported the addition of Spokane River access points to create river students for the future. See, that's <laughs> Jerry is next. Thank you. So my name is uh, Jerry White Jr. And uh, I at one time was the Spokane Riverkeeper, am no longer. Uh, so in not, not speaking for the Riverkeeper, I now work for the Upper Columbia United Tribes. Um, not speaking for that particular organization either. Uh, just, uh, I've got a room full of lawyers here. I want to make sure that uh, that the voice I'm speaking with today is uh, Jerry White, um, uh, lover of the river and uh, resident of Spokane. Um, and I'm going to say some things uh, that, you know, are, are 
are my own opinions about where we've been and where we're going to go. And luckily, my friends have have uh, have covered a lot of that. So uh, hopefully, with all of these slides that are designed to take 25 minutes to show you, that's a joke, Brian. Uh, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll get through this. So. Um, the Spokane River uh, is 111 miles long, uh, and you know I I do want to acknowledge. Uh, well, I I, I want to put forward the idea that uh, it is my own opinion that the Spokane River uh, absolutely deserves its own to be recognized and afforded its own rights to exist, and I do believe that one day we will get there. We're not there yet. Um, but it is a community member, um, and it certainly uh, deserves that respect and that legal status. Uh, I believe the Spokane River is a confluence of critical, what I'm calling here critical harmonies, which are uh, the people. Um, in our case, we are on the traditional uh, homelands of the Spokane people. Um, we have now 500,000 people at least between Coeur d'Alene and two rivers at the mouth of the Columbia River. Uh, and uh, those communities are, are key uh, in the life of the river. Um, the river itself, and then the third critical harmony are the fish. Uh, and it, this is a, a stock photo of the Chinook salmon, which is, uh, as Margot spoke about, could grow at one time to be 80 pounds, uh, but were un, you know, tragically extirpated. Uh, uh, and I'm gonna talk a little more about them um, and because we actually now do have salmon in the upper basin above Grand Coulee Dam, which is an extraordinary uh, development, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So I am going to move quickly through these slides because they've been covered really, but uh, you may recognize this photo, and I do apologize if some of you see photos of your own up here. Uh, I'm not going to give photo credit. Uh, I'm not making money off of this, so hopefully that's just fine. We'll roll through this, but this is a photo of the you can see the clock tower back there, and you can see what uh, downtown looked like at one time. The river itself was a uh, recipient of municipal garbage, uh, industrial waste, uh, and um, the hydroelectric projects, the dams that have been spoken about, and landscape alter uh, alterations that, that really damaged the river in, in a very uh, dramatic way. And what I want to I, I want to call out that there was very little or no regulatory backstops in these days of the dark days of the early 20th century. That's an important note. Very few regulatory backstops at all. In other words, the river was not being protected by law. Uh, in 1969, of course, we've seen this. This is not the Spokane River. This is the Cuyahoga River in Ohio, caught fire, actually famously 13 times, and galvanized uh, really the nation to begin to wake up to the crisis that was unfolding for our waters. And uh, because of that, we saw the Clean Water Act of 1972 passed as an effort to begin addressing these kinds of atrocities. Uh, Expo 74, of course, uh, why we're here uh, today to celebrate uh, was a, a really a consciousness turning point for our own community. Um, and and uh, I wanna call out here that the values were really manifest in these regulatory frameworks like the Clean Water Act. In other words, law reflects value and we began to recognize that we needed laws to protect uh, something as precious as our river. Um, and the, the I've got some acronyms up here, which is kind of sloppy of me, DOTMDL and PCBTMDL. What those are, are cleanup plans. That's a dissolved oxygen cleanup plan that, that uh, Marlene spoke about. And then we have uh, in draft form very soon, a PCB toxic pollution cleanup plan being developed. These are very, very important. These are legal documents 
uh, that the communities will be held accountable to and responsible for. Uh, these would not have happened if we hadn't had the Clean Water Act of 1972. And the, the, you heard uh, Marlene talk about the great things that have happened uh, under the city of Spokane's watch by the Ingl Integrated Clean Water Plan, uh, you know, in, in, in large part because we have this regulatory backstop that drove collaboration and drove us to address dissolved oxygen levels that were not appropriate. Uh, the PCB TMDL will be open for draft. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, Katie Scott uh, at Riverkeeper will be uh, talking about that in, in a few. Uh, but that's a very important one. The standard that the communities we will, will be working to to meet are very difficult to meet. They need to be met, but they're driven by a water quality standard that was developed by the Spokane tribe. And in fact, Margot Hill uh, was involved in that process. Uh, and that, that standard is designed to protect water, but very importantly, it's designed to protect people whose heritage it is to eat fish uh, and have done so for thousands of years, right? So uh, that standard is designed not just to protect our, our precious river, but also communities who depend on fish for, um, for, for so many uh, values. I'm way behind here. Sierra Club photo. This is my, I'm at one minute. Okay, we'll thumb wrestle for a little more time here. This is the issue that I think uh, it really, it, the river does not have regulatory uh, cover for, and that is river flows. River flows uh, have been uh, dropping. I think this is a Sierra Club photo of the drought, uh, that drought year of 2000, 2001 at Bolin Pitcher. The river was down to 700 cubic feet per second, which is uh, a very, very low flow. I'm just gonna show you this uh, photo here. These are the, the, I want you to just recognize the trend line between 1891 and 2020. Uh, these are the summer low flows and they are dropping precipitously. And uh, they're, what I really wanna do now, I think, because what am I down to 30 seconds or so, or I'm there. Uh, is just go to the very end uh, slide, which is we can uh, cut our water use. And there is something that each and every one of you can do is watch that summer irrigation water. There's a whole suite of activities that we need to put into place to protect aquifer water that goes into the river. Uh, but it is something each and every one of us can do, which is to cut our water waste. We need to be thinking about the why of this. Uh, we have the uh, we do have the Upper Columbia United Tribes of the Columbia Plateau leading the way in protecting resident fish and bringing back the Chinook salmon to our basin. So this is an essential biodiversity and cultural issue, and conserving water and making sure we have a river for the next generation is absolutely critical and essential for those, those that triad of harmony is the people, the river, and the fish. Um, thank you very much. And I, uh, I really, it was a privilege to, to, to get to be here with uh, these great people and all of you. So thanks. Well, thank you to everybody who did so well with uh, their seven minutes to uh, frame our conversation so effectively. Well, there's incredible knowledge about our Spokane River uh, with this panel here today, and we have about 45 minutes to engage in some additional conversation about it. So I'm going to uh, launch a few questions, but I'll be sure to uh, open it up for your questions. Uh, so be thinking of those as we uh, cover some uh, of our topics. So. I think if some of this was a touched on a little bit, but if it if you feel like you didn't have the opportunity to fully respond to this question in your presentation, I'd like to hear what do you view as the greatest accomplishments for the Spokane River since Expo 74? So in the last 50 years, what have been the biggest wins for our community and the river? Well, you can go first, Anna. Anna's up. 
Do we need to do anything? Be close to it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Perfect. All right. Thanks. You have something to say? Well, I'll I'll simply say that I I do believe that the the turn of consciousness that I that I brought up that that really uh, we're beginning to see a values shift uh, in the way we look at our river. And that will be critical to uh, passing a healthy river down to the next generation and the generation after that, is that value system that really was, uh, I think uh, Expo 74 gave, you know, ma manifested. Yeah, um, I agree. I think it's really about how we as a community have changed or shifted how we view the river. It's not a project. It's not one um, item. I alluded to, you know, in the early 2000s, we were fighting over how do you protect this river? We were being the regulator community, didn't really even know or much care what was going on. And instead, we started talking about the river differently, talking about how it was the center of this community. It's the jewel of the community. It brings in recreation. It brings economic value. It is a sacred place for our sovereigns um, that have uh, been here since time immemorial. And that, that it's the attitude of the people now that care that's really been the biggest shift. They've taken the laws and actually gone, oh, these have these have uh, weight and we can use them to really center and focus our community about a wonderful place. And I would just share that um, I think uh, the city of Spokane has come a long way um, from using it as a dumping ground uh, for our municipal waste, uh, for our sewer waste, to, um, you know, when Mary Verner was mayor, uh, there was a complete study done on the water and to understand the aquifer and how our river is connected to the aquifer and that it's, um, uh, we're all responsible for water quality because our river is our drinking water with our aquifer and understanding the science of it. I would recommend all of you uh, to get a copy of Spokane River uh, edited by Paul Lindholt. It has scientists and, and river lovers like Jerry White Jr. Um, and the tribal perspective, um, but it really tells the story of the aquifer, the archeology, span the anthropology, the science, and then also the legal aspects uh, with uh, Rachel Pascal Osborne. Uh, but we have come so far from those first studies done on the river and all of the amazing work that our city of Spokane is doing, but we have more work to do um, with water conservation. As Jerry was talking about, our city and our citizens waste more water uh, per person than a lot of communities across the country. Um, and <clears throat> the city has implemented a, a code and uh, looking at enforcement, but it comes down to uh, don't be watering your lawns uh, from 10 till two in the afternoon uh, because that water is just wasted. Uh, so just better conservation. Um, I, and that, that shift in attitude, I really think ha has helped us with our cause to protect the river and the river flows. I, I just had one little thing to add. I mean, they, they all said it so graciously. I was kind of where my head was as well, but you know, the, the other thing is, is the access points, the view corridors, the um, the renewed connection to the river, because I think, you know, what people care about, they protect, right? So um, as we've um, done work, all of us, what we've done is, I mean, how do you get a raft on the river? How do you, where's a great place to fish? Where's a Where's a great place to, you know, ride a stand up paddleboard? All those things exist on a river, but we weren't doing them. And now we do them. And the more people that interact with the river, I think that's been a huge change since Expo. We interact with the river much more. We run along it on trails. And uh, um, and uh, and that connection will be ultimately what protects it for our kids and our grandkids and beyond. Thank you so much. I think that really is a powerful way to talk about law as value, um, where all of the keystone environmental statutes of the early 1970s for clean air, clean water, really showed a shift in a value that what we want is clean air and clean water and our choices and our baseline regulations need to be consistent with supporting that. Um, 
one of also a little vignette of when I was uh, teaching environmental law here at uh, Gonzaga, I would go on field trips with my students. And one of the field trips was the wastewater treatment plant, uh, which has a amazingly beautiful location right, <laughs> right next to the river. Uh, and I had a wonderful student who would always challenge me about uh, environmental regulations, like the the market can decide this, Professor Waldreff. You know, like we don't need to have all these regulations. And we we went to that trip. We saw the very very important work that our wastewater treatment plant does, that has water then go back into the river uh, directly, standing on that point source. And he's like, all right, Professor Waldreff, we can have clean water regulations. That doesn't seem so bad. I want our river to be clean. So really having that amazing, you know, personal connection of like, we want this river to be safe and to be vibrant uh, for our families for years to come uh, is just a wonderful way of showing our values. Um, so now this is the less optimistic question of what are, uh, we know there are many challenges and we've discussed some of them, but kind of what the what's keeping you up at night challenge about uh, the Spokane River right now. And I'll, I'll start back with Jerry. I know where you're going. Yeah. Yeah, right. I had a bunch of slides I didn't show that really reflected uh, or breezed past them that reflects, I think, some 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 deep fears I have. And one of those is in a paradigm of a consumer culture that we look at water as something to be commodified and consumed far beyond what's sustainable. And if we do not get our hands around uh, that particular perspective and the way we approach consuming water, I, I, I'm, I think we have a real challenge ahead uh, to keep our river alive and to keep the hopes and dreams and aspirations alive of recovering uh, salmon and the benefits that will bring to all 500,000 people someday, I'm sure a million people that will live in this, in this valley. So that water quantity, that river flow of cold, clean aquifer water coming in, it, it's, it's, it is going to be a challenge and that one worries me. I gotta sneak in one more real quick. <laughs> and that, and I, I'm sure others will address this too, but the other, and it's connected to, I think this bigger systemic issue of, of marketing things with no real thought to where those things are going. And I'm speaking about chemicals, speaking about emerging chemicals like the perfluorinated chemicals, uh, microplastics, um, <clears throat> frankly, pharmaceuticals, uh, and a number of things that we run, uh, unfortunately, uh, through our systems and end up in our in our water, but also in our fish, which are part of that critical harmony of what a living river needs to be, which is a biodiverse uh, uh, system with a healthy, thriving population of fish. So those chemicals of emerging concern are 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 a deep concern to me for sure. Uh, I, I want to respond to your first, uh, um, the water quantity issue. I think I 100% agree. I think that we abuse um, our water resources pretty significantly here. We love green lawns, it's hot, it's dry. Um, we know a lot about our river aquifer system here in this community. We did, we spent eight years studying it and understanding the interactions. It is vast, but that vastness comes at an expense to the river. We know when we pump in the summer, we are robbing water from the river significantly. And then the regulatory framework that is in place to protect the river and use that resource doesn't match up to the value. We are operating on a 1917 water code that says first in time, first in right. We gave the river a water right in 2015, but it is junior to every other use here. So it doesn't really, it matters because it means going forward, there's we can protect it moving ahead, but we cannot protect it from what we have already done. So that takes community effort, community engagement, awareness and understanding about how we're using our resources. It's really, really important that people understand that the law doesn't actually help us get much further right. for what we've already done in this case. Um, and I, again, back to emerging contaminants, uh, we have to be really thoughtful about uh, what we're doing at the top of the stream. That's where you 
prevent pollution. It is so difficult for Marlene to be removing all of that at the end of the pipe because we just buy it, use it, and it goes away. So that's my two cents there. So, um, and, and I would share just, I, I'm not a scientist, but we smet clo heads mok, mok Our ancestors, you could see, look at the snowpack. We just do not have it. And for the spring runoff and, and, uh, and our river flows, um, uh, Jeff and I have been out in the river with Jerry where our boat stopped our, our, and Jerry had to get out and push us right at the aquifer. Um, our water consumption um, is just uh, beyond what we need to protect the water flows, the water quality, the water temperature. If you look at um, uh, the, the laws, the, the current laws just don't protect what we need. If, it's, if you look at the Hearst decision, um, it is exempting domestic water wells. We just punch them in and then nobody's uh, uh, quantifying those water uses. And uh, folks like Department of Ecology or folks maybe don't have the staff or resources, but people are sucking water out of the ground and out of the river at great extents. If you look at the Columbia River, all the cold, fast, wa the, the water goes to irrigation to Yakima, to Banks Lake, we're just sucking water out and using it as far as water consumption. And our salmon are the litmus test. They are um, the, the, uh, the species that can tell us, hey, we need cold, fast running water. And if we are out of salmon, what a sad world that was. We're used to not having it up uh, past uh, Chief Joe or uh, Grand Coulee. But think about it throughout our tributaries of Washington State, what a sad day it will be if we don't have orca whales. And that's a greater indicator of our lack of uh, salmon that we're, we're killing off the species. Um, you know, I, I think to, put, to kind of piggyback on what, what Jerry was saying, um, we didn't know when we approved, and I say we, EPA or whoever approved the use of things like PCBs and PFOS, we didn't know what those things were going to do. I mean, PFOS, we say it's emerging, but it's been made since the 1930s. Uh, uh, PCBs were the same way. We, they were banned in 1972 and we're still dealing with them. Uh, um, and, and the citizens of the city of Spokane, generally speaking, did not make them, did not use them. Um, yet they are charged with cleaning them up. The, the money that the city has only comes from our customers who are the people who live here and the businesses who operate here. And so, so those are the kinds of things that as we approve new ma magic chemicals, we really need to start thinking about what does that mean long term, right? Um, when I sat in deposition for the Monsanto case, they shoved a, an advertisement in front of me. I was the city's... Um, uh, uh, what do you call it? The, 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 I represented the city, right? So I was supposed to be all the knowledge of the city This as, as this witness. And they shove a, an advertisement across where, where there's, a, there's a genie coming out of a lamp. And it was it was magic. These were going to last forever and protect you for it's like, well, didn't you know it would be persistent in the environment then based on this advertisement? It's like, well, one, we never bought it. But two, <laughs> it's like the, the thought then from the 1930s or 40s, whenever that advertisement from this was this was a miracle um chemical. And look what our miracle chemicals are doing, right? So so I think when we talk about microplastics and we talk about these things, what are the processes for approving new things? before we then have to deal with them. So our, the next generation of people sitting in my seat have to deal with 50 years from now or 100 years from now because of, of poor choices we're making today. So I, I do think that our big one of, them, of our biggest challenges is how do we um, really review what's new and what's coming in? Because we already know some of the things that we have to deal with that are already here, but what can we do to avoid creating new problems in the future, I think? It, you know, how do we have that foresight to know what what's the bad thing, right? There are all significant challenges raised by uh, this panel and how many uh, issues that Spokane faces that, uh, as Marlene was saying, we didn't create, but we need to address. Uh, so, I mean, environmental protection, uh, we don't live in our own dome here, right, uh, in Spokane. Um, the Expo also recognized that, that it was the World's Fair uh, celebrated here in Spokane, Washington. And we had folks from all around the world uh, coming and presenting around 
uh, a variety of topics, but focusing on environmental sustainability. What is a lesson um, that we could learn from that you know, type of an event uh, in the early 70s where there was you know, initial energy around environmentalism um, that we could use now in ensuring that there's a, a global solution uh, or at least a global effort towards uh, greater uh, justice and environmental justice? So it's a pretty broad question, but kind of uh, let's maybe to hone it into what on a global scale uh, would you most love to see happen uh, in terms of addressing the climate crisis or environmental issues? Should we that? Yeah. But I can start with Marley. So I would say um, it's the ability to find common ground because um, perhaps Margo wants to see us use less water for a different reason than Jerry does. Or perhaps me as the water system operator wants us to see use less water, for example, um, if I don't have to, if people use less water in the summertime, I don't have to create a system that manages huge capacities of water for six weeks out of the year. I can I can create smaller infrastructure at less cost to the citizens. Hook can't be with that issue of affordability. So there are, there are different ways to sort of approach these these concerns, and there are reasons to do these things. That there are multiple reasons, multiple good reasons. To, to address these things. So can we, with something like Expo, find common ground in, in why we wanna do these things? And so we can disagree about what are, is our primary reason for why we wanna do something if it gets us to the same place. I, and I will uh, share that common ground is a, is a great starting point because all of us depend um, on the drinking water and the the aquifer, the Rathdrum Prairie Octif aquifer, there's so much development that we've got to figure out safe development because the science is there's not much protection over our Octum, uh, 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 Rathdrum Prairie aquifer. And so we've all collectively got to work to protect the, the development that's happening every day. Um, over that aquifer, uh, other finding other uh, solutions, point source pollution. We still have pipes dumping uh, craps and chemical right into our river. I don't have all the answers. I am, I, I'm not a scientist, but figuring out solutions. Uh, we have tire dust, tire dust that comes from all of our cars collectively that goes to the runup, that goes to the river, that is a toxic soup that kills our salmon. So there's a lot of work that we can do, not only uh, conservation, but finding some solutions for some of these major issues. Anything? Nope. All right. So I, what I, Jerry. Well, I'm, I'm not going to pass up an opportunity. Uh, to, yeah. Uh, solve problems, Jerry. Yeah. Well, look, uh, it's hard to beat uh, Marlene's um, call for uh, finding the intersections uh, for for um, agreement on on ways to go forward to to really value our rivers and our environment. So that that really is, I think, critical, is to get past these polarizations, open up our minds and understand that, uh, you know, our rivers and our waterways um, provide a multitude and a manifold of values. So anyway, that's just repeating Marlene's, uh, what Marlene called for. So I totally agree with that. I do think that there is room, and I'm gonna revisit what I initially said, uh, to continue to uh, reflect values through law. And that is um, beginning to afford uh, rights uh, for natural uh, community members to exist. Right, we, we have this for corporations now. Uh, it feels like to me that we need to begin looking at uh, these critical components like rivers and salmon runs and asking ourselves at what point do they have an inherent right to exist and that those inherent rights are protected by legal systems. Thank you. Well, so I'm going to save a little bit of time at the end to make sure that we end with our hopeful question about what is something that we each can do uh, to protect our river. <laughs> but before we save that, uh, I want to make sure that we, we we have a good amount of time for questions. So let's open it up. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, John Alder with the uh, Equity Subcommittee for the City. It was in this room that Jerry White brought up person in that had the evidence that Monsanto did dump PCBs into the river. I heard PC, uh, Monsanto's settlement mentioned. What was the settlement and how is it affecting the river today? I guess that's mine. Yeah. Um, that's, so uh, the city was one of 12 named litigants that sued Monsanto over um, PCB contamination in waterways. Um, and uh, there was other cities, Long Beach, California, um, and different that had different problems, right? So you know, uh, there's a lot in the in the ports in in some of these coastal cities and so forth. So um, we we challenged uh, what their responsibility was for that. And so to date, um, we settled for that particular case. So Monsanto has also paid out, for example, on there's been a PCB settlement around Hulk and schools, for example. So this was specific to to um, contamination in waterways. And um, this, there's about a $500 million settlement for communities. So um, any community that had um, a TMDL for uh, PCBs or um, a TMDL-like, which was Spokane with our direct to implementation approach, received some money. Um, so we got about $6.9 million for that. Our neighbors at the county got another couple million, I think maybe four that they get. Um, um, the city of the Valley got a little bit of money. Um, so our region got that. And then because we were one of the named litigants, we were able to apply for some of the holdback money for those for that class of, of um, cities. And we got another 12.9 out of that. So we have 20. All of that money is going into improvements to help primarily around stormwater. Because if you think about how PCBs end up in the river, it's often going across lands that are contaminated. So as we manage stormwater before it gets to the river, that's our, our largest um, effort at this point, because now we do have tertiary treatment at the treatment plant, which manages a lot of the PCBs as well. So, so that's where that investment is going. Um, and the, the county and the valley also have the ability to make those investments. We have one more pot of money that we're gonna apply for here. And so it's possible we can see a few more dollars. I was just going to add, I don't know the specifics, so this is not that helpful helpful of an answer, but the state of Washington also received funding through settlement with Monsanto. Um, and I believe it went into the general fund, but there was a lot of conversation about it should go back to communities that are dealing with this issue. So I thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Natalie. I work up in the Disability Access Office uh, here at Gonzaga. Um, my question is mostly directed at Marlene, sorry again for the second question, um, but any of you can add to it. Um, specifically talking about uh, environmental and social justice, uh, I think Spokane has this awesome program going on with Spokane Scapes and making our wonderful green lawns into something that's more sustainable. However, um, in order to participate and receive funding for Spokane Scapes, you have to invest a lot of time and money. And so how is the city working with um, poor residents, people who are struggling to make the time and have the extra money in order to put a Spokane Scape in, in order to further help the river and the aquifer? So what is the city doing in order to include those residents who don't have the time and money in order to make a Spokane Scape? That's a, that's a really good question. So we have a couple of things that we've been doing. Um, for example, we worked with the, the, the Lands Council and others on, on some tree planting um, in the, the northeast part of town. And one of the options was to turn your boulevard strip into a Spokane scape. And we did that as part of that program. Um, uh, another thing that we've been looking at is how to reduce the cost. So um, we are working with a couple of landscape designers to create designs in a box is what we're calling it. And so that people can take th those concepts basically um, use the ideas and extrapolate them for their own front lawn. So you don't have to require you to hire a landscaper to do that. Um, and in some cases, we're even working with some of the, we're starting to work with some of the folks who sell plants to say, can you, can we come in and say, yep, here's your, here's your lavender, here's your other plants that you can go and then you can take and, and plant. So, but we do recognize that. Um, what we have asked for Spokane Scape, if you haven't noticed, is that we require people to put it in the front yard if they get the credit, because what we're trying to do here is not just have you use less water, but we want your neighbors to see your design, and we want that to become more of a culturally accepted way 
um, for you to landscape uh, around there. So, so yes, you're right. Um, we do have some challenges there and we're working for ways to do that. But um, the goal here is to try to change what we see as beautiful. My name is Johanna Flynn and I would like to uh, ask for comments on something that Jerry mentioned about Spokane River being made an entity. It brings to mind to me um, a river in New Zealand, the Wanganui River, which is um, a, considered an, an entity. So I would hope that you would all like to jump in and comment on that concept. I'll, I'll just quickly say that, um, of course, the, the tribes uh, have a contract with Mother Earth and uh, our river and animal people that it's an exchange. They The salmon was the first to uh, sacrifice and go f and feed us. And so it's our responsibility and obligation to take care of the environment, uh, the, the land, uh, Mother Earth. And um, there are concepts about the rivers having rights. Uh, Karen Stratton of the city council was trying to do a river acknowledgement. You know, many people do a land acknowledgement, um, but recognizing that the river has rights. We see uh, the river spirit. Um, and uh, actually, uh, Alex Sherwood um, said in, in 1974, uh, or the speaking to the river, I find myself talking to the river and I might ask, river, do you remember how it used to be? The game, the fish, the pure water, the roar of the falls. You fed and took care of our people then. For thousands of years, we walked your banks and used your waters. You would always answer when our chiefs called to you with their prayers to the river spirit. Sometimes I stand and shout, River, do you remember us? Yeah. Well, I mean, I would say my heart's just where Margo took us. Um, I think it's a, it's an interesting concept, but then I start thinking as, you know, a regulator, how do you do that? What is what do, what do we have already on the books that maybe could be incorporated into that concept that, uh, you know, have to create something new? And so I think it's something that should continue to be explored and be explored in a way that it's practical and applicable. Otherwise, you just have something that's on paper that doesn't actually do you any good. But you know, spiritually, my heart for sure, I'm there. I would echo it from the lawyer brain. It's like, ah, this is not yeah. compute. Like, how do I handle this? Um, but I think the court system often follows when uh, there's community activists and there's the constant reminder of this is what the community is calling for. Uh, so even if there's not like the, the legal acknowledgement in, uh, I mean, I think there actually have been you know, briefs that have been filed before courts saying like this, you know, physical entity deserves a right. And courts sometimes have a really hard time thinking outside of the box. Uh, we need community leads and activist leads on, on that front. Um, but I think that's a wonderful, thank you for raising that question. And thank you for that beautiful quote, Margo. Any other questions, Amanda? Hi, yeah, uh, I'm Amanda Parrish with the Lands Council, and I have a question. Um, it seems to me that the Spokane River has a real burgeoning function in an environmental justice sense as a public cooling shelter. Um, I think that animals flock to water in the summertime to stay cool, and we are animals, and I think 50 years from now, this is a community asset that people will be using to stay cool in the summertime, so I just wonder if there is some, some foresight to how we protect um, adequate public access, safe public access to the river for, for that environmental justice function. You go I mean, I, I'm just gonna say a few things about that that may, hope may, may not be too much, but um, I think I, I would say having spent a lot of time in the last 20 years on the river when it's very, very hot, communities are absolutely already there, right? Um, so really what this is about is 
uh, doing what you all are now doing at the Lands Council, which is great, and the Climate Center as well, and giving voice to that need and giving voice to that use. And then uh, I think really incorporating that in with uh, city leadership to begin recognizing that use and intentionally planning around it. And, and I think this is one of those interesting cases where we can see the river as more uh, than just water, but it's actually that corridor. It's that entire riparian area uh, and the forested, beautiful forested corridor that so many of us in this room already know and love. Um, and 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 I, there's city planners in the room right here right now. So I think it's just about having those conversations. Uh, back to Marlene's point, and and really, re and then daylighting. What are these values? What are these uses? And and getting out ahead of that with with the plans uh, for 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 that kind of need and that kind of use. Hey, I just wanted to say one other thing on the rights of nature piece. Uh, we have Katie Scott here with River Keeper, who has actually worked on uh, some of that kind of legal science. So maybe you all can get together and talk about that. <laughs> Call your right needs. I, so I want to respond to you. Um, Pu existing public uses are protected in the state of Washington, right? Public access is part of the Shoreline Management Act and shoreline planning that the local cities and counties do. So continuing to protect that access, I think there's a mechanism for that. As far as the notion of cooling shelter and communities having access, I, I think that's brilliant. And I also think there's likely funding opportunities through the state to continue and further that work. Again, the Climate Commitment Act is raising billions of dollars in this state. The money comes from people that pollute, and the intention of the funds are to be used in communities where there you need to implement climate resiliency strategies. You need to connect with overburdened populations who might need resources uh, to move forward. So, I think I think that's that's super thoughtful, and there's is a mechanism, and let's continue to explore it um, together. And, and I would just say that there's great organizations like Conservation Northwest and other environmental groups, uh, Lands Council, that are doing the work to restore habitat. Because, you know, we in the Palouse, you know, we just wipe out the trees um, right up to the river uh, and, and we have pollutants going into the water. And so having the restoration of habitat to keep the water cool running uh, for fish and humans is really important. So the work that our, our nonprofit environmental organizations are doing is really important. Yeah. And a lot of that is funded by Climate Commitment Act dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, think, I'm stumping now. That's Sorry. wonderful. I mean, I think from the state and having their climate commitment dollars, and then there's also the federal funds from the Inflation Reduction Act that are you know moving into the communities right now. And one area that we've mentioned is, you know, law has its limits. We only have the regulatory baseline that is currently on the books. And when we have really creative ideas, where there's a lot of potential and energy is where we can send the money to have those uh, projects be done, even if it's not required by the law, because the law might not have standards that are sufficient. Um, what we need to do is have creative solutions and have the money in the hands of folks who are able to implement these really uh, important, beneficial projects for our community. Thank you. Um, so I'm Catherine Alexander with Soil Smart, Soil Wise. Now, what I haven't heard is talk about soil. And in truth, you don't have water without soil. Soil holds water. If we shifted a lot of our intention to soil and making the city a sponge to hold water, we would not be using as much because we wouldn't need to water those lawns. They would have water. It would reduce our water loss. It would increase the cooling effect because wet soil makes it cooler. We plant things like many forests then we're bringing back rain because they transfer evaporate and we get the rain coming back. It's a whole cycle, the small water cycle. It is, I think, one of the key things that we could do. And it gets everybody. Everybody has a piece of this. If we could begin to focus on making the soil in our city resilient and healthy so that it holds water, we stop using chemicals, Gonzaga wouldn't be using so much water because the soil would be wet it would be great. It would really help us. Is there anything that you guys can think of that we could do in that area now? 
Well, I'm just going to jump right on that real quickly and open the aperture of that question out to a region-wide kind of perspective, which is uh, if, if you look at the work of Department of Ecology the, at the state level, uh, actually in concert with Spokane Riverkeeper under their settlement settlement agreement for, for uh, Hangman Creek, you'll see that uh, Palouse Soils um, that there's a lot of initiatives to try to, to to try to protect soil because just as you're saying, protect what's good for soil is good for water, um, and so I, I would encourage you to to talk to these folks and learn a little more about what is going on in the way of ag best practices up in the basin because it's it's absolutely um, cutting edge stuff, uh, direct seed tillage and that kind of thing as well as riparian recovery, um, and has a vast impact on everything all the way down to the Columbia River, uh, all of those blue soils. So anyway, that's my little pitch for that, but um, the city city might be a different answer. I don't know. Um, you know, we the state passed on some new legislation recently that requires us to use compost. Catherine and I talked about in um, in new landscaping that that occurs at whether it's on our projects or other projects. So so that's that's probably one thing that's that's going on right now. I to to Jerry's point, you, you know the 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 heartbreaking part of spring runoff is that brown uh, stream coming in from from Lake Top Creek into into the Spokane River where. We know, as we said, the, the the toxics and things ride on the sediments, so we're bringing in all kinds of sediments into the river on an annual basis um, every time that flows. So, so the more we can do that way, if we can keep those soils where they where they're doing good for agriculture rather than having the topsoil run down, um, certainly it's something that we would love to see at the city, just because of of what it means to us as it rolls past um, into the into the city limits. And I will mention that tribes are walking their talk. Coeur d'Alene tribe uh, bought land along that Laytaw Creek uh, for restoration and habitat instead of a huge development of housing complex uh, with more possible toxins going into the river. So tribes are doing what they can to protect uh, lands. Nagmana. My name is Nagmana Shirazi uh, with the Climate Justice Program at the Lands Council. Margo, I really wanted to thank you because I know Brian as well as Vanessa, both of you mentioned, kind of touched on the on it a little bit on the how the evolution of this whole space where we are today, right? But you specifically mentioned Chinatown. And in order to build the riverfront park, Chinatown was moved literally overnight. And that was a huge injustice. It was done at that time. So we really need to acknowledge that. And we really, really need to think about that and then move from that from that history onwards. And again, going back to what you were talking about, the symbiotic re relationship between the aquifer and the river. And my colleague, Kat Hall, when she went up to do snow school with the school children that she takes up and educates every year, she told us in January when we had that huge snow melt when it, with, the, with the heat wave in the middle of January that we had because of climate change, right? Mm -hmm. And where there would have been 15 feet of snow, there was only 40 inches. So how that runoff, how that's going to end up in the aquifer, uh, what amount of water there's going to be, you're already talking about being on the river with Jerry and the boat getting stuck, that's crazy to me already. But fact is, at the bottom of our aquifer, at the bottom of Lake Coeur d'Alene, where our drinking water comes from, all these places, right? There is heavy metals. There's like 10 feet of heavy metals sitting there. So when the river level goes down, the aquifer gives us water. As the river level goes up, it pours back water into the aquifer. So it's a symbiotic relationship. And think about it that, okay, it might even happen this year, who knows? But all that stuff sitting at the bottom is going to leach into our drinking water through the river, through the aquifer, through the lake. So we, whatever we are doing, it's not enough. We need to be doing more. And it's, you know, yes, the laws are important, but really, we really need to be thinking about the human factor in this as well. You know, it's going to affect us, it's going to affect our children, it's going to affect our city where we are living right now. So whether it's town planning or the, whether it's uh, conservation, whether it's greenhouse gas emissions that we need to be thinking about, we really need to get very, very serious about this. The Climate Commitment Act is up for repeal on the November ballot. 
we really need to do something about that. Yeah, we the, we haven't even had time to talk about Coeur d'Alene Basin or Superfund cleanup. <laughs> um, those are entire other issues, but we think about the toxics and the metals at the bottom of Lake Coeur d'Alene. And as a mother, when I was pregnant, I was very concerned about our fish consumption. As tribal people, we know that uh, salmon and fish have high nutrients um, and that would be the best for our unborn child. But you also have warnings that say don't uh, eat this fish or fish consumption. Um, and so it's really pretty scary. And the Superfund cleanup sites that we have both Lake Coeur d'Alene Basin and on the Spokane Indian Reservation from uranium mines. And, and Twella, I think we'll be talking about that later. But there's lots of concerns and there's lots of work that we need to do. I just want to offer one thing it's related to the um, the Superfund site. I represent Washington on the Idaho uh, Basin Environmental Improvement Commission. Anyways, uh, but you're right. There's 70 million metric tons of heavy, heavy metals sitting in the Lake Coeur d'Alene. But I want to assure folks that we do monitor metals in suspended metals coming across into the, into, um, the Spokane River. And, and currently we are in a safe place. There are still some sediments that are coming across and coming back to our beaches. But again, we monitor those to make sure that they're safe for people to continue to recreate on. So at the moment, we are okay, but it's something that we are watching. And I appreciate that you are paying attention to it. And it is something that we all have to be listening to. There's a lot of work happening in the Silver Valley to, to right those wrongs as we speak. Thank you, Brooke. And I, I would add that um, <clears throat> the Spokane tribe right now uh, is is designing a study um, to look at sediment moving through the river and measure uh, the presence of metals in, in that um, down in the lower river where it enters the Columbia. And, and some of that work is being done in partnership with the Colville tribe. So there's a lot of work going on to try to understand what the long-term sublethal effects of, of metals are. Are there any, is that still occurring? There's, um, so I just wanted to put you in the loop on, on that, that there is a, a huge urgency on the part of leaders in the in the region to, to, to look at that issue for sure. Cause it's a, it's a, it's a spooky one. Yeah. Doozy. Yep. Hi everyone, I'm Amber Waldruff related to this wonderful person up here. Um, and I just, I was just thinking, wow, I started working for the Lands Council in 2004. So I'm, I'm celebrating 20 years of working with all these wonderful people up here on all sorts of projects. Um, and when I was a city council member with Marlene on the river cleanup um, and integrated clean water plan. So I just wanted, I was going to, Nagmana stole my thunder because I was going to say, that Climate Com Commitment Act is on the ballot. So I had three things I was going to highlight, and then I was going to ask Margo um, about the urban planning piece of this. Um, so three things that are coming up where everyone can get involved is we have an item on the ballot to repeal the Climate Commitment Act. So that's something for people to take note of and study up on and talk with their um, friends and family and other voters about. The other, um, the other thing that's come up that uh, maybe we don't really think about, but the, we actually have a tool in Washington State called an aquifer protection area that can be established in a community. And Spokane County has been managing that, um, the APA. Um, the city of Spokane is not participating currently, so it's just the, the areas around the city, um, but that's up for renewal. Um, it's going to expire next year, and there's an opportunity to put that on the ballot. It's like a couple dollars a month, and that those go toward education and awareness and uh, monitoring some of the flows in the river. So that is an opportunity for the community uh, to think about putting that on the ballot in the next two years and having the city of Spokane be part of that. And thirdly, the 20 year growth management update is underway in Spokane County. And Brooke had on her slide, one of the key laws in Washington state is the Growth Management Act. And we don't always think about that in relation to environment and justice, but the Growth Management Act requires communities to do a 20 year outlook of how they plan to accommodate more population, more people, 
and what that impact would be on resources like our water, our aquifer, our river. And so um, for the first time, we have a new climate change chapter that we will have to, that Washington State is requiring us in Spokane County to actually think about climate change as we plan for growth. We also have a 20 year old water system plan uh, for Spokane County that is being updated for this. So I was gonna ask Margo, how do you see this opportunity for this 20, updating our growth uh, plan for Spokane County and how we could use that as an opportunity to protect the river, to think about water use and um, where we grow and how we grow? Um, yeah, that's a great question, thank you. Um, as Amber mentions, the, the, the Growth Management Act and environmental planning and this 20-year uh, time period uh, really gives us an opportunity to do some good um, urban planning and, and think about the environment. Um, I'm, I'm pleased that we live in the city of Spokane and that we've made such large investments in infrastructure from the CSO takes. Um, you know, I take my urban planning students down to the sewage treatment plant. And they go all the way through to the end. And we're, you know, they they've got to see it. And 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 we go down to the storage tanks and we walk through uh, with Marlene's staff and and see the the work that needs to be done. But there's lots of education that we need to do. Urban forestry, um, you know, uh, just looking at when you're doing urban design, the swells and absorption of some of that runoff and, and the natural ecosystem that cleans the water. Uh, before it goes back into the river. And those are all things that we need to plan in our city communities. Um, and uh, again, just a, an important aspect is that education aspect. You know, uh, Jerry uh, and I have, Jerry White Jr. and I have been down to city council uh, when the conservation code uh, was being discussed and, and people were complaining um, that you're gonna limit our water usage um, but then there's just little steps that we all need to do uh, to conserve water. And I think that's important is the education of our citizens. And then again, urban development over that aquifer. If you understand the uh, science, there is very little protection uh, between that development in, in Rathdrum Prairie and our water. Uh, that that gives life to us all. And so we need to make sure that we're working, uh, that our city uh, uh, decision makers and politicians are talking to Idaho yeah. and, and protecting our aquifer. I, I have I have one one little um, thought that I'd like to share. and and that is, I, I, I said something that I think sometimes, uh, isn't always seen uh, that that in my talk that uh, I learned in the advocacy that I was doing for 10 years. And that is that law reflects values. So, you know, uh, it's very, very important that we, we must do more than what the law requires to protect our river. But when we pass a, a, a piece of law, and sometimes laws get a bad rap, right? Because they're regulatory and they're, uh, they're but, but when we do that, such as the water conservation ordinance, of course, it, it, it's a challenge to know how to implement that. And there's going to be holes in those laws at first. But what those things do is put a flag in the ground that says, we as a community value uh, what this law is protecting, and it allows the decision makers uh, who are sitting at this table with me to to then some cover to go out and say, this is the community has spoken. We've passed this law and we are going to uh, we're going to adhere to it. We all value public safety. So we have speed limits right? To protect public safety. Is it perfect? No, there's still people speeding, there's things. So I, I just would encourage this whole community to understand that while voluntary work and incentives and collaboration is absolutely essential, that we do see the law as signaling a value system. Thank you very much. And I think we've gotten some uh, helpful advice already about what we can all do with water conservation, some uh, important legislation that's upcoming. Uh, Amber uh, teed us off with some uh, important tips and also gave you a little 
a uh, hint of what it might be like at the Waldorf family dinner table, which uh, <laughs> a lot of discussions and problem solving that we're uh, trying to engage in. Uh, and she, had, for me, has been an, uh, an incredible teacher on these areas as, as she's an expert in uh, land use and environmental uh, issues as well, as well as this great group of people up here. And I've learned so much uh, being able to be a part of this event. And so I am hoping for... Uh, you know, that what's leaving this uh, day and this wonderful event, what can we all do to have our river be stronger or protect our environment more generally? And I'll kick off with Jerry. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Just uh, adhere to the new ordinance if you're inside the city limits of Spokane and use less water on irrigation would be would be a wonderful start. And also look for ways in which uh, you don't have, you're not wearing clothing that are coated in PFAS. If that's possible, companies are now starting to, uh, PFAS is a toxic. So, you know, start doing, um, Brooke mentioned, try to catch those chemicals way up, upstream, you know, because it's, it's a, a better way to keep them from getting into our water system. So I would recommend uh, looking up, uh, you know, safer chemical, uh, the state of Washington has an initiative where you can find out what what kinds of products are a little bit safer and more green to use. So there you go. Thanks. Uh, be curious, ask questions, educate yourself. Um, and then those little tiny actions really do add up what you're doing in your home or your household makes a huge difference. So that's where I'm at. I'm going to run off a list of Expo 74 events. I'm the chair of the Tribal okay. Pillar. Um, and so I'll just take this opportunity to invite all of you to participate in the environmental history tours. Uh, a doctor, a medical doctor, John Osborne, along with the Sierra Club, um, we're going to be having some tours May 18th. Uh, restoring the Spokane Falls, uh, and June 22nd, protecting Lake Coeur d'Alene. As far as our tribal pillar events, um, we're going to have a big powwow at the convention center May 25th and May 26th. We're going to have a Native American music festival and fashion show June 13th at the Riverfront Park Pavilion, uh, Native Theater June 14th. Uh, June 21st, we're working uh, uh, with Nogmana, and we're going to have the Environmental Legislative Summit at the convention center. The tribes are also going to be hosting a buffalo feed and, and salmon dinner. Uh, the governor will be coming in. We're going to have canoe races um, and just have a, a big celebration. Throughout the Expo 74 events, there's going to be the spoken word. And we're also going to have some historical tours uh, that looks at the, the historic battles. So just come and, and, and learn about the culture and history and be educated and share with your neighbors. Okay, so what I would say is, you know, take ownership, be the eyes and ears for the river. So make sure that your neighbor's putting the motor oil where it's supposed to go. Um, make sure that you're not, you know, leaving old paint around. And we, we have we have ways to take care of that. We can bring we can bring your old paint to waste energy facility. We'll take it from you for free. Um, ride your bike, uh, walk on the river, and and. You know, think about why it's important when you watch that Zag game and they show the beauty shot. It's always of the river, always of the river, except for the Zag up front. Somebody's usually sitting on the Zag, but or the dog, the bull <laughs> on spot. But other than that, it's always the river. And remember that Spokane can make big things happen. We shouldn't think, oh, we can't do it because of Spokane. Because in addition to Monsanto, remember, it was the Spokane community that led the effort to uh, ban phosphorus in laundry soap. We have, no, you can't buy phosphorus laundry soap today. We also then is, uh, started work to ban phosphorus in dishwasher soap. I don't know if any of you remember, but our neighbors were driving to Coeur d'Alene so they could get so they could get Cascade from Costco in on the Idaho side for a while. So it was like the dishwasher scoff laws. They couldn't get their dishes clean. You cannot buy dishwasher soap with phosphorus today. So we can make a difference from Spokane. It just takes effort and time and commitment and um, taking ownership. I feel like that's a great way to end this panel. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being part of this with gathering the information that we're learning today and bringing it to your community. Thank you.
what a great opening panel. One more time, we should thank our panelists. That was really good. Thank you. So I'm hoping uh, you're able to come back for uh, the afternoon at one o'clock. We will have our keynote speaker, uh, Cliff Villa from the EPA at one o'clock. But between now and then, we uh, have a meal down the hall. So uh, please uh, feel free to make your way there and enjoy some food. And we'll see you here shortly before one o'clock. All right. Thank you. Well done.